Welcome to The Mary Mack Show, where we will be talking about your feelings, experiences, and pain following the death of a loved one. friends, my warriors. This is Mary Mack of the Mary Mack Show. I am in the process of doing a podcast series entitled Death by Fentanyl. And I have the privilege of being with Diane Urban today. Her son, Jordan, was 25, just shy of his 25th birthday. And he died on April 6th, 2019 from fentanyl poisoning. He also has an older brother, four years older, named Joshua, and she decided that she wanted to do more, more advocacy and more outreach and to help people better understand what fentanyl poisoning is doing to our families. And so she began an organization first as a Facebook group and then as a nonprofit, and it's entitled the Association of People Against Lethal Drugs. And the acronym is APPALL. And we are, we're all appalled at the fact that we have to go through this in our lifetime. And I am so grateful that she's taken some time today to be with us. And so Diane, I welcome you and thank you so much. I'm grateful that you were able to be with us tonight. Thank you very much for having me. Quite welcome. So I always like to start by asking you to tell us uh, more about Jordan and his life and his growing up years, your family and um, that sort of thing. Sure. Um, Jordan was born on May 3rd, 1993, uh, by cesarean section. Um he slept through the night from day one. He was like, it's so perfect. I, I just he slept so much and through the night and very happy baby. And, uh, you know, he was uh, such a fun, you know, young boy. And uh, when he got into elementary school, he was involved in what they called the quiz bowl. Uh, he loved answering questions and doing quizzes and stuff like that. Uh, he was also involved in, you know, at a younger age of uh, T-ball. I think everybody did that back in the day. And he really loved sports a whole lot. Uh, he loved anything having to do with Ohio sports, mostly because of my dad brought him up that way. We'd go over there every <laughs> Sunday to watch the Cleveland Browns or Ohio State or the Cleveland Cavaliers. And uh, so he was a huge sports fanatic, uh, loved him. Wouldn't miss a game unless he had to work or something. And, uh, <laughs> so, yeah, it was great. Uh, he loved sports. My whole family is a sports family. So we're all, you know, into big time Ohio sports. But um he also loved to do card tricks. Uh, he studied card tricks a lot online. And uh, oh, that's YouTube, different. He would love to come in, uh, you know, was at, at, at 10, 11, 12, 13. And oh, look at this new card trick, you know, I got, you know, and he was amazing card tricks. And like, I'm thinking, wow, how could he do that? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, he loved card tricks and uh, and he loved uh, Xbox, of course, video games. And uh, he also um, he liked to uh write songs, write lyrics. And he actually aspired to be an artist, a singing artist. And he actually uh, had two songs professionally recorded. Oh, wow. Yeah, one was called Hold Up Blessed and one was called Nightmare, which that one um, just got released uh, uh, 
shortly after he died. Uh, uh -huh. So it was kind of a, a hard thing to take because that song Nightmare depicted his uh his uh fight with like the demon or the reaper who was out, you know, which was a drug, you know, his battle, you know, trying to get past his, you know, uh addiction, his uh, uh substance use disorder. But I mean, growing up, he was just your average, every ordinary child who, like I said, loves sports. Uh, he had so many friends. I mean, anyone that ever met Jordan either liked him or, you know, they loved him. He just had a kind, uh, loving heart and soul. He had the beautiful blue eyes. Uh, he just had uh, some empathy and kindness about him. Um, that's just beyond words what he's uh, done for people. I mean. I take him to the grocery store. He would always help out people, uh, you know, elderly people. I mean, he just, uh, he was always a helper, always a giver. And, um, so yeah, uh, I, I think all through high school, I mean, he got good grades. Um, I think it was like as shortly after high school is when he started uh, experimenting, you know, with more drugs, uh, other than marijuana. And, uh, that unfortunately got him into the cycle of drug addiction, which he didn't, you know, obviously expect to happen. Uh, so yeah. But yeah, that's how I pretty much grew up. Uh, stayed in Ohio the whole time. And um, he sounds like a very compassionate person. Jordan was very compassionate, very loving, very caring. And even though he's no longer with us, just look at everything he's um, in his own way through you have given back to all these people. And I'm sure all of this has saved many lives because of what you've done on his, in his name. Well, um, I didn't pick this path, obviously. Mm -hmm. I don't think any person in their right mind would pick this path. Uh, it's, it's a lot of pain. It's a lot of agony, but, uh, it helped me, uh, have direction and help me, um, get through the, the grief more by doing more to help bring awareness and help people. Yeah. So it kept me focused on doing something because anytime I can help a parent or family member or a friend or anybody, whether they're struggling from addiction, um, whether they need help or, you know, anything, you know, I mean, I'm there for them. That's wonderful. Yeah. Would you mind telling us about the day he died? Um, Jordan was clean about eight months, doing very well. When he developed a severe wisdom tooth pain, found out it was growing in the wrong way. His face was swollen. Um, he continued to work, but he was only working part time. So he only had access to Medicaid insurance, you know, through Ohio, state of Ohio. So he couldn't get an appointment to the dentist. Uh, it was two weeks out. So he continued to work for the whole first week, waiting to get into the dentist. And uh, he did the best he could. He worked and April 5th, that night after work, he relapsed. He made a decision that he couldn't take the pain any longer, which I found out through his text messages from his friend. His last text he sent to his friend, his friend had asked him, hey, do you want to play, get online and play Xbox? And he said, no. He said, this tooth pain is melting my soul away. Oh. And he was really in that much pain and uh, there was nothing that could be done. He just had to wait. So he gave in and uh, apparently he, well, I know he went, through text messages to go get his drug of choice, which was heroin. And um, instead he got pretty much 100% fentanyl. Oh, and my it killed him pretty much instantly. So, uh, you know, um, I woke up that morning at about 7 a.m. His stepbrother was spending the night with him. And he came and got me. He said, something's wrong with Jordan. And uh, I'm like, what? So I go in there and uh, I see him curled up in a fetal position laying on the floor. And uh, that's something you'll never unsee. And uh, we tried to give him a mouth to mouth to resuscitate him. But I knew he was gone because um, unfortunately he was already turning slight color of purple. And, uh, and all I could do was scream. I screamed and screamed and screamed. And I begged, thinking that if I could scream loud enough to God, he would uh, shine the light down and bring it back to me. But uh, that didn't happen. So 
uh, it's just the worst pain imaginable. I mean, I don't know what their people have been through in their lives, but uh, I'll never be able to unsee that moment in time. Yes. I mean, and so uh, that's what led me to uh, doing what I do. It's because, um, you know, no parent, no matter who you are, what walk of life you're in, even if you're a criminal per se, I mean, losing your child is like, it crushes you. I mean, I think about my son every day when I wake up, usually about every half hour, hour, I think about him throughout the whole day and before I go to bed. I've actually slept in his bed in his bedroom since the day he died, which is where I'm at right now. And uh, it brings me comfort just being where he was, spent so much of his time. So, so yeah, I had two choices. Um, I had to, you know, do something or I could like grieve forever because, you know, you really, you want to die when something like happens. You just don't really see a reason ahead of you to live. Yes. Definitely. So um, I thought he, at first, initially, I thought he overdosed on heroin because he hadn't done it in so long. He'd been clean. Um, so when I got the toxicology report and it said that uh, it was fentanyl and had a couple other ingredients, but uh, it was enough fentanyl in a system, you know, to kill, you know, four or five people. Oh, my goodness. So. And he just took, you know, a small portion of it because we found the rest of it. And so, you know, when they show you on a photo or on a screen, like it just takes a couple of grains of fentanyl to kill you. That's exactly what it takes, just a couple of grains. So then after I looked, I thought it was fentanyl. And I'm thinking, well, what's fentanyl? What's fentanyl? I didn't know what fentanyl was. So I started looking up on the computer and reading up on it. And uh, the more I read, the madder I got. And I thought to myself, I have to do something. And so I uh, created just a simple Facebook group uh, just for friends and family and people locally to try to help get the word out. And uh, and then I just got bigger and bigger. And uh, um, and so um, at the time I had a, co uh, a lady come on uh, board with me. Her name was Kathy Lawley. And at the time we changed names, uh, she helped me found it. So she was co-founder. Um, since then, um, she resigned about a year ago, but uh, she's a great person. I love her to death, and uh, she always knows she has an open door to come back. But um, but so, yeah, it just it's kind of like you have to do something or you're going to sit and grieve forever. That was my thing. So I just took it, and I just uh, I did all I could to uh, once I started picking up momentum and people were taking, you know, to the messaging and just bringing the awareness and it just got bigger and bigger. And so then I had to, you know, get a 501c3 a nonprofit. And mm -hmm. uh, and basically, you know, Paul is known mostly for our uh, nationwide rallies. We just had our third annual nationwide rallies this past uh, May 6th. And we had- Where was it? Where was well, it? There were, there were 30 cities across America, all on the same day on May 6th, rallying all the way oh. from uh, California to New York. Oh, that's so great. Uh, so yeah, uh, so that's, you know, basically what we're mostly known for thus far. Um, but, you know, the thing about rallies, people sometimes say, you know, well, you know, rallies are kind of a waste of time. But I can tell you because um, I have uh, uh, over 20 state chapter groups and, you know, people that we don't have state chapter groups for some cities that have them or some states that have them. But what the rallies do, most importantly, is for the parents. People, the parents especially, they want to be heard. They yeah. want to be seen and they want to be heard. The cops are not listening to them. You know, the investigators aren't listening to them. You know, no one's listening to them. So what they tell me, you know, it's what I hear so much is like, you know, the news came out and they got to tell their story and they got to stand there, you know, whether it be in a public square or, you know, on a street and, you know, and tell their story and hold their sign up with a picture of the loved one and say, you know, fentanyl killed my son. You know, it wasn't an overdose like the sign back here says it was fentanyl poisoning. Right. So, um, you know, because that's really what a lot of us, you know, want, even including myself. You know, if I could say anything to the administration we have right now is like, you know, look at me, hear me. I'm right here. You know, I mean, last year, 105,000 plus people died from this. Uh, what's it going to take? And so um, it's it's important to the people. And as long as the people want to do it, uh, I'll continue having them and helping them, you know, 
organize this huge event that takes, you know, five months of solid, you know, planning to get done, but, uh, but it's all worth it because the people, um, the parents, especially, they really, uh, they like getting out there on the streets and uh, being a voice for their child or loved one. Yeah. Without a doubt. Yeah. And they, it makes them feel more empowered too. It does. It gives them the strength to, uh, uh, to get up and, uh, and, uh, you know, speak to others about it. Uh, people don't think they can do it, but you know, once you get out there uh, and have your first rally and your for your first speak engagement, it just gets it easier and easier. And so it does, it gives them, you know, uh, a sense of empowerment to be able to get up there and, you know, you know, speak about, you know, their lo their loved one and, you know, what they meant to them and how they didn't want to die. And, uh, you know, we're constantly looking, you know, for change, something to happen, lawmakers to do something. Right. Cause what we're doing now is pretty much not a whole lot of nothing. So do your, um, your groups, uh, the people who attend these rallies, do they try to go to, um, the congressmen in their area and try to get more done? Yes. Um, I encourage all of our state chapter groups and the people uh, that are in them. Uh, I've given them letters like uh, sample letters that well, how you can write your congressman, you know, some stats you want, might want to give them and stuff. So, you know, yes, I've given, you know, the tools to, to letter writing, you know, things you want to ask for. Uh, and some people do, you have to be persistent. Yes, <laughs> definitely. Me. I mean, you can't just write one letter and expect you're getting an answer back. Sometimes you do, but, you know, from my experience, you know, to get a formal, you know, a uh, sit down meeting, you know, it takes more than just, you know, one letter of phone call. So I stress the importance of, you know, you got to keep calling. You got to keep following up. You got to keep writing and stop in person. You yeah. Know, do what you got to do. Don't stop. So. Yep. And invite them to the rallies too, yeah. so that they can really see. And it may be very uncomfortable for them to be around such, um, you know, sorrowful people, but this is life. I mean, this is real life. This is what people are going through, you know, and they have to have enough courage to go out there and be there with these families. Yeah, I really wish that uh, more people and more congressmen and senators and lawmakers would just, you know, come out to these rallies. But so far, it's just very, you know, sporadic. Right. I mean, there's always something going on when you have it, you know, if you have it on the weekend, they're not working and they're busy. If you have a rally during the week, you know, well, they're working, you know, so it's, it's really hard. Uh, but I know Texas has some great people out there that's uh, showed up to, you know, some fall rallies and uh, fentanyl awareness rallies and, uh, yeah, you know. So it just, uh, everywhere's different. Every state's different. Yeah, that's very true. And I don't know if the members of the U S Congress or Senate really have a handle on the magnitude of this, you know, I, um, I don't think they do. No, I don't think if so. they do. They have a strange way of, you know, showing it. Um, mm. I mean, I think we all know that the cartel controls the border. It's pretty blatant. Uh, right. They charge the migrants, you know, money to get across the border, you know, and they'll, you know, have uh, go through ports of entry with drugs here. And then everybody's busy over here with these, you know, migrants passing here and the drug bust here. And then they're all up and down other ways, you know, transporting the drugs, smuggling them in there. And it's just never ending. And until we can, you know, get the cartels under control and secure our border, uh, you know, that's a good first step. Right. A great first step. And then, you know, for the people that are addicted, they don't need to be in jail. Uh, they need help. We need more resources for rehabilitation, you know, long-term. When my son came to me with his addiction problem, you know, first thing I did was, you know, I got, you know, I got on the phone and I got him help. But it took a long time. I mean, there wasn't, they take you for like 15 days, you know, sometimes 21. And then they just, you know, give you a handbook and wish you well. And that's about it. And you, for me, living in a rural area, it's like, you know, two hours away anywhere, you know, so it's like, it's hard. It just needs to be more available, you know, in small cities, you know, more in the bigger cities. Just, there's just so much that could be done. It's such a multi-layered, you know, thing. There's just not one thing you can do to make it better. It just takes so many different things to all come together. No, I, I totally agree with that. And I find too that there's still that it'll never happen in my backyard, you know, attitude. Um, people who um, 
they don't want to be associated with this because they think, oh, well, my child will never OD or my child would never wind up uh, addicted or my child will never um, take a pill with fentanyl in it, but they can't know. And so that level of education that needs to be um, brought forth, which so many of the groups that I'm interviewing now, so many leaders are, you know, doing that same thing, trying to teach young ones that this is not a joke. This is not a game, you know, just because your friend decides to hand you something and you, they would say, oh, this will make you feel better. Try it. Mm-mm. You don't know where that came from, what's in it, how it's going to affect you. Mm. I hear you. And that's one thing that, um, I'm about ready to get into the schools, you know, this fall. And uh, oh, one wonderful! Our, one, one of our main slogans, I'm starting, you know, in where I live and I'm branching out, but I'm going to start locally here where I'm from. But one of our main things I want to, you know, tell these people is like uh, pills are power. It doesn't matter. One try and you can die. And that is any would do any street drug right now, even marijuana. Yes. One try and you can die. That's just how dire, you know, the situation is. And uh, for anyone that thinks that it couldn't happen to them or their child per se, or their niece or nephew or whoever, you know, you don't know. I mean, kids are kids, you know, be all at a party, you know. I mean, fentanyl is so toxic. And now, you know, to boot, they're mixing, you know, Trank with it, you know, now. Oh my God. Yes, I've heard about that. And so anyone that thinks they're going to be all at a party, you know, taking, you know, a Percocet or, or, you know, cocaine, you know, or marijuana, I mean, it just can't be trusted. It just cannot be trusted under any circumstance. Even yeah, like so Xanax or, yeah. you know, they think they're getting, see, the biggest issue is they think they're getting one thing and they're not. Yeah. Those, uh, those pills look exactly like the pharmaceutical pills. They have the same impressions. Uh, yeah. And, you know, powders, I mean, you know, <laughs> that's just, uh, that's even more worse that, you know, you just never know what you're going to get. If someone's thinking they're going to get cocaine. I mean, it's just, just say no. I mean, back to the word Nancy Reagan, I think just say no or just say yes. no. Program. Yes, but yes, that was her slogan. Just say no, just say no. I mean, it's simple to say that, but when you're dealing with, you know, teenagers, you know, it's hard because they want to experiment when they're out there with their friends. You don't know what they're going to do. It's an unpredictable environment. Yeah. And then you got to think about the people suffering from addiction, suds. You know, they're struggling to try to get clean, perhaps, and they're out there. And, you know, if they're in active addiction, you just never know. I mean, it's just very scary on all fronts. Without a doubt. Without yeah. a doubt. I'm, I'm really glad you're going into the schools. I think that will be really helpful. Yeah. Um, very helpful. And um, I had spoken to Jaime Puerta and they're on their website, stopthevoid.org. They have that dead on arrival and I think that's so impactful. You know, it's only like 20 minutes, so it could keep the attention of young ones. Yeah. And um, yes, I've watched that video. Uh, amazing. Very good. Very well done. Yes, very well done. Yeah. Um, I especially like when Steve uh, showed the different little bottles of how much would make you overdose and then you get down to the to the fentanyl and it's like just these little granules in the jar. Exactly. Ugh. And that's why uh, people have to let the stigma go and uh, just realize, you know, that, yeah. uh, that we're in a crisis. I mean, I mean, when's the last time, I mean, the leading cause of death in America right now is fentanyl. And, you know, where is the action plan? You know, what's, what's happening? Right. Uh, what? I mean, we're waiting. We keep pressing forward and we keep waiting. And, uh, and so that I guess the best thing until then is education. Yes. Start educating them, you know, young and, you know, letting them know and showing them, you know, that what can happen to you. I mean, it's hard. It's sad to say you don't want to like scare children, you know, right. But, you know, I mean, they need to know that, you know, I mean, you know, things are different now than they were then. Like when I grew up a long time ago, I mean, you know, you didn't do drugs because you might get some bad drugs per se, or, you know, you might get addicted, but like now right. today, if you try something, I mean, you, your life will be over just like that. It could be. Right. Exactly. And you don't know whether that's the case or not. You can only know that it, you know, they're intentionally 
creating counterfeit pills and they're intentionally wanting to kill our youth, our whole, <laughs> all our military level children, right? And that bothers me a lot because of the intention of it, you know? Yes, um, it is so astonishing. Um, sometimes I'll do graphics for my members and they'll send me photos and they'll make them a nice little graphic. And after you do so many of them, I mean, it's just like you see all these faces and, you know, people think in their minds somehow that these people that are using drugs or died from a drug or even substance use disorder, that they must look all cringy and, you know, downtrodden and, you know, but no, these are beautiful, wonderful, you know, people, children, teenagers, and adults that's died, right. you know, because of this. It's not your stereotypical somebody laying on alley, you know, just, you know, doing drugs. I mean, these people are just, you know, regular people, just like me and you. Yep. Just so happens, you know, one mistake in this day and age and it could kill you. Definitely. And, and the, the thing about um, the children that bothers me the most is how it's stealing their innocence. You know, yeah. I mean, to think that you have to tell a 10 year old, for instance, or less <laughs> that right. there is something out there that can kill you and you teeter on how much do you want to tell them so they won't get involved versus how much you need to tell them so they won't get involved. Right. Exactly. You know, you don't want to make this a possibility for them, but at the same time, if you don't tell them, right. it's worse. So right. it's trying to figure out, you know, the right age and some, you know, that's a whole other, you know, story, but, uh, you know, social media is another thing. Oh my goodness. There was like two cases. I think the girls were 13 or 14. They were uh, talking to a guy online and uh, they met at a park for some kind of drug or something and they got fentanyl. I mean, and so these young kids are on social media and these predators are out there and it's just horrible. And where's the accountability? There isn't. I mean, you know, I'm hoping things are getting better, but I really don't know if they are for sure. I mean, it's just... I just, it, I feel so let down by, you know, our lawmakers. I just wish that they would do more. Yes. I mean, there's so much other stuff that, you know, seems to be the top of their mind these days, you know, but yet something that, uh, you know, this is wiping away a whole generation, you know, of people, you know, it's just, and it's just, they're not batting an eye. Right. I mean, they bring it up occasionally, but uh, it's just, I don't know. I still think it comes down to maybe stigma. They think, well, they tried the drug, you know, why should we, you know, care, you know? Right. Yeah. But I reject stigma. I reject it too. I think that it's just an excuse because if you have myself. the ability, I mean, if you have the ability to just take one pill, especially for the, you know, the younger ones who they don't know the difference. They just, you know, they go along to get along with their friends. It's a matter of peer pressure and, the next thing you know, they're dead. And then for even those like your son who had been a user, he didn't deserve this. I mean, he, you know, he believed he was getting one particular drug that he was accustomed to. And, you know, it wasn't that at all. No. And so, so I just, you know, all these people, like we said before, oh, that won't happen in my backyard. Or, you know, my children don't get involved with anything like that. Well, there's a lot of children who wound up getting the wrong product. And even celebrities, right? Even celebrities, oh, yeah. families and celebrities um, who, you know, I, I read recently that Prince was killed by fentanyl. I never read, I never heard that before. That was new to me. I knew that he died probably of drugs, but we never heard what from, you know? Yeah, I think a lot of them like to keep it secret. Obviously, they don't want to get the word out. But uh, yeah, there's have been quite a few uh, celebrities, uh, recording artists, even, you know, uh, major sports players. I mean, people have died, you know, yeah, from drugs, illicit drugs. And uh, it's just horrible. And I think uh, Master P is a rapper. I think his son died. Yes. So yeah, the list goes on. So it's just, 
you know, what do we do in the meantime? We educate, uh, yep. we hold events, we have rallies, uh, and we just go to schools. And uh, I'm so super proud of Jaime out there in California. He's doing great things with Amy Neville. Uh, they're both wonderful people. So proud of them. Uh, that's why I'm so excited to get started on my end with going to schools finally. It's just like, you know, I, I have the door shut so many times around my area locally here. I don't know what really? small town thing. Yeah, yeah, that's the whole thing you got to deal with too. Um, I'm not really sure if it's a small, because I just, I'm not really sure why the thinking is in certain cities it's different where you can like two or three counties over, they're all in on, you know, suicide and bullying and, and drugs. But then, you know, oh, county here or over there, you know, no, nothing. No, nope, we don't need you. We're okay. Nobody's here. We're fine. <laughs> like, <"I'm> fine. <laughs> right there's one uh cluster of three counties where y'all ain't have no overdoses or nothing <laughs> so yeah it's stigma i'm pretty sure yeah definitely when i did speak to amy neville mm -hmm. um they were talking about um an event that's coming up and uh the authorities were like well we don't have a problem in our area <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay. See, that's that's how some uh, schools operate. That's how some, you know. Uh, cities, places. big cities. Yeah. I mean, it just depends. I mean, you know, and like, I deal with, you know, people nationally across America and in various, you know, cities and states across America with appalled. And uh, it's just so surprising how some states and cities are so helpful and so, you know, focused and other ones just, you know, they don't even care. No problem. You know. So, yeah, you just never know. Every and they're not doing their citizens any, you know, any good. Nope. It never hurts to uh, put the blinders on. Yeah. Without a doubt. Yeah. Oh man. And so um, as you go about going to schools and, and reaching out at what level will you go? Like, will you go into junior high schools and high schools? Um, yeah, that's my, my goal is to get into the junior high so far. I've not got a response from them, but I do have an appointment to, to visit with the principal here locally. So that's a start. That's <laughs> great. I mean, you know, it's a start from like last year, you know, so yeah, I don't know why they didn't want to, you know, have anything to talk to, but now I, they want to talk to me. So um, I'm happy to go in there and, you know, talk to them and uh, answer any questions. And that's what it comes down to a lot. Even like I went to to my local Eagles uh, club here and uh, they, you know, wasn't sure what it was about, you know, appalled when I said, well, hey, you know, I'd like to come, you know, speak, you know, about appalled because, you know, you're part of the community and we're tight knit. I was like, well, we'll get back to you. Let me talk to everybody about it. And, you know, they looked at my website and they were like, well, OK, <laughs> well, we think we want to have you and ask some questions. <laughs> so, yeah. People just they don't know. I mean, you'd be you think worrying about people living in a bubble, but uh, some people just really. I guess unless it's not directly affected you or someone you know, yes. you would have no idea, you know, so. Yeah. And unfortunately, after it does affect them, they'll think to themselves, wow, I should have really learned more. And that that's what's so sad about it, because that that sense of ignorance, like you said, that sense of being in a bubble, you know, that protective bubble that makes you believe everything's just fine for me. You know, my whole world is just great, right. you know, and too many outside forces can destroy that in matter of minutes. Right. Yeah. It's time to buckle down because, um, there's a map, uh, you should, I don't know if you've ever pulled it up to see where all the cartels are located across America. Have you ever looked at no, that? No, no. Tell us where you can find that. Um, I don't have the website right on me, but uh, I can send it to you via email. But basically, if you just go, where are the Google it? Where are the cartels located in uh, the United States of America? A map will pop up, and you'll see little circle dots where they're all at. Oh my and, gosh! And they're already implanted everywhere across the nation. Uh, so yeah, this is serious business. Uh, if anyone thinks they're in a bubble, they better think again, because oh. uh, they're out there, and. Uh, that's their goal is to make money. And if they kill people along the way, they don't care because, you know, people are constantly having children. And there's always, you know, the five years old turns to seven and eight years old and the eight years old, eight, nine, ten. Then they get into that group, of, you know, of their target age, you know. And uh, so, yeah, just more customers. And they don't feel I, a bit bad about it. 
Very true. So yeah, and, yeah, a lot of that map. It's very, it'll blow your mind yes. when you see that they're just all right by us. I mean, you know, and it's like, what? And I'm wondering, you know, if we all know where they're at, why aren't we doing something? Exactly. Why so aren't we doing something? To go, hmm. <laughs> yeah, I, I do that. I think uh, who's gaining out of this when, if you're not doing anything about it, you know, exactly. so, so my friends, what I'll do is I will put, I will look it up and I'll have that link down in the show notes so you can go and see that. I appreciate that. Yes, absolutely. Along with all of Diane's links. So you can go and join her organization and whether you've been affected by this or not, you know, it would be good for you to go to these rallies in your city, in your, you know, in your country, excuse me, in your um, state. If they're not right around you, take a little, you know, ride and go spend the day and do this because it's not just those who've been, you know, extremely affected and lost, you know, a loved one. We need more help. We need more voices. And that's what we need from you. Exactly. Very well said. Thank you. I, I, um, I find this entire situation unfathomable. It's, it's so deadly and so violent, you know, um, when I lost, uh, my stepdaughter, Angela to murder at 11, um, never did I realize that all these years later, the rates of murder in the United States are so low compared to the murders of fentanyl poisoning. I mean, nowhere near in comparison, yet people are being murdered every day from this drug, this illegal, illicit, counterfeit drug. And the worst part is nobody knows it. I they know, just right? don't know it. They don't know this is going on because, you know, as Michael Grace says about the paradigm shift, you know, years ago when we were growing up, you could experiment, try a little of this, try a little of that, you know, and now the days of experimenting with drugs it's over. They're it over. And it's just really sad, the whole thing. It is sad. And I hope that uh, America wakes up, our lawmakers wake up, this administration wakes up, or the next one wakes up and uh, really puts together, you know, some kind of action plan and uh, get something done. Uh, because, you know, at this rate, you know, 100,000 people a year at least gone every year. And that's only the ones that they know of. Yeah, exactly. So, so yeah, that's on very, where we find ourselves today, unfortunately. Right. Well, Diane, I've really enjoyed this conversation. I thank you so much for joining us. I thank you for all the advocacy work you're doing and all the people who follow you and help you and are involved with Appall. And I want to just give you the website again. It's www.weareappalled.org. And it stands for the Association of People Against Lethal Drugs. And that's who we are people against are. this and i thank you for all that you do for others you know i don't know if people understand the level of pain um bearing a child is you know what it does to your psyche and this is a mother who decided that she wasn't going to be the um bitter resentful, um, you know, angry mother. She decided that she was going to give back and make sure that there were a whole lot less people that had to endure what she's enduring. And so I honor you for that because it takes an awful lot of energy and devotion to build an organization like this and all the people involved and all the moving parts and all the, the chapters and the events and the rallies 
I mean, boy, Diane, <laughs> you've really accomplished so much. Well, it's just, uh, that's my, my piece of, uh, this, uh, everybody has their specialty of things that they do like Michael Gray. He's a wealth of information. Um, you know, everybody, all the, you, uh, you've met many of them. Uh, yes. We all have our little piece of the puzzle that we're working on uh, to try to help uh, in any way, uh, fathomable. So, you know, thank God for all of us out there and, uh, anybody that wants to help, <laughs> please we'll let me know. take the help. <laughs> <laughs> Diane will take your help. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, well, thank you again for spending some time tonight. Um, we honor, you know, your son. And we thank you again for everything you do for all the people out there. So God bless. God bless you. And thank you very much for having me on your show. You're quite welcome. Bye now. See you later. Bye. 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 <laughs> Thank you.